Well, good morning here from London and welcome to today's FS Club webinar and our guest today, Charles King. The subject is VR, AR or MR. Is the virtual world more real than we think? So that's virtual reality, augmented reality or mixed reality. And Charles has a very interesting view, uh, somewhat uh, commercial, but nevertheless an extremely interesting view about MR. Uh, you'll know me. I'm Michael Mainelli. I'm one of the directors of Zen. And it is my privilege, honestly, to be able to open these webinars thanks to our sponsors. We have a wide range of sponsors from all over the world who let us explore technology, economics, and finance. And they're extremely tolerant and reasonable in letting us explore a whole variety of things. But today is very much in the zone of technology and finance. We're going to be looking uh, at how uh, some of these new applications can fit together on the one side of where they're currently being used and have a little think about what they might do in the financial services industry as well. Now, the format today is fairly familiar. Uh, my job is to get out of the way so that you can get to our expert, uh, Charles. And Charles's biography is already on the site, so uh, no, no offense intended, but I shan't read it out. Um, get straight to the matter. We will be having approximately 15 to 20 minutes for discussion, so please use the GoToWebinar chat facility uh, on the toolbar that you can see. Uh, I'm here with you, so if you send me an email, I won't get it till afterwards, uh, but if you do send it through the chat facility, I'll feed it into a conversation that Charles and I will be having about the technology, and we would really appreciate your comments, questions, or observations about uh, VR, AR, or MR. Well, enough of me. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Michael. I'm delighted to be here, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. We're going to explore the question, is the virtual world more real than we think? And I'm hopeful by the end you will not only agree VR, MR, and AR are here to stay, but you may also think twice before accepting what your intuition tells you is true about the real world. I'm Charles King, CEO of Wizdish, Rover Systems, and you will find us on the web under either name. Next slide, please, Mike. Because there is an overlap of technology, and we'll, we'll be looking at definitions and applications of AR and MR, and then dive somewhat deeper into what I think you will find is the surprising and more involved world of virtual reality. So next slide, please, Mike. So I, we're going to have a quick poll because I think it would be helpful to know. So anybody who's used any aspect of VR, so this would be a, a phone in a Google Cardboard, maybe a wired headset, or even one of the Oculus Quest's wireless. Well, really the, uh, interesting to know if you've ever well, tried that. The answers are coming in. Uh, Give just a little bit. We've got two-thirds of the audience have voted. They're very quick off the mark, Charles. Right. Okay, and we'll close the poll. Well, that's that's amazing, actually. 70% of the audience have tried it. So you've got an audience which has some understanding, but you've kindly provided quite a few demos, I know, for the other 30%. So back to you. So that, no, that's really helpful. So so next slide, uh, please, please, Michael. Um, okay, so starting with definitions, because this field is a confusing space. Augmented reality is usually informational data, text or an image overlaid on the real world. And the central image here of a runway with green textual information is classical now, as is the pilot's helmet with head-up display. We've all seen these. And as you can see, AR has been around for some time, being developed during the Second World War. We see here Google Glass on the right and Intel Vaunt glasses on the left, now owned by Google. And Pokemon Go, another form of AR, uses phone's GPS data to superimpose Pokemons in the camera's field of view. Uh, you may remember this way back in 2016. Pokemon kept a lot of people happy, including children in Great Ormond Street Hospital, where Pokemons were placed in wards and corridors. The next slide, please. There's a serious side to AI, of course, in engineering build and repairs, medical training, adding data to surgical procedures, and so much more. And many will have used Google Street Maps Live View, which displays AR data about places on your phone's camera's view. 
pricing partly reflects the early stage, but also the application of established technologies, but just in different formats. Next slide, please. Mixed reality blends virtual objects into the real world view, and that is technically challenging. Because if virtual objects are to look real, they need to act as our mind model of them predicts. That is, an elephant on our hand needs to be on the surface and not with its legs submerged in our palm, even if we move our hand. An occlusion is what happens when an object gets closer to us. It blocks our view of other things. Our view of people in the gym needs to be blocked by a whale looping, just as we would expect. Getting moving objects rendered onto a moving real world scene is challenging, but it needs to be done at plus 60 frames a second. Bear in mind that TV is down at 24 frames a second. The next slide, please, Michael. Magic Leap and HoloLens are examples of mixed reality te technology, but rendering at 60 plus frames a second remains a challenge, and so the HoloLens field of view is only 43 degrees, a bit like sitting close to a laptop screen. Nevertheless, this is still amazing technology, and Citibank and UBS have investigated traders using HoloLens, and they are in use now in aerospace and engineering more widely, and in education to name but a few. So they are making, they are making progress. So though already valuable and amazing technology, there's more to be done. And as you can see, the price tag reflects the novelty and the technical challenge. The next slide, please, Michael. I suspect most are aware of the concept of virtual reality. We are talking Star Trek's holodeck here, not the matrix. The definition essentially says, if we are standing in a room and we take a step forward, if the room moves as we expect, then we will believe it is real. After all, our brains are data processing centers. Feed in the right information and we will accept it as real. What this means is that buying a VR headset does not mean we have purchased VR. To get that, we must interact with what we see and receive brain cues that match our expectations. The Oculus Quest, launched in 2019, seen here in the bottom left, is a wireless headset providing almost everything we expect in real life. The other images show applications of our Rover VR treadmills which supply the other crucial component, the ability to safely and intuitively interact with what is seen. The next slide, please. In the 70s through 90s, the DOD, Department of Defense, and NASA used VR for training pilots and astronauts. Simulation sickness was and remains a key challenge because more than 95% of people start to feel unwell if what they see does not match with what they feel, a so-called visual vestibular mismatch. Unfortunately, the more expert you are at something in real life, the more susceptible to mismatch in VR. Well, now, for planes and cars, we are seated and separated from physical movement by a stationary frame of reference, the car or plane cabin. So long as what we see, feel, and hear in a simulator matches our expectations, it will feel real. After all, we are seated and use our hands to induce movement in both real life and in a simulator. The simulators don't need to look like the real thing. But walking, well, that's a whole different ball game. There is no interface. It's us that moves by walking in real life, and we are experts. Somehow, we need to be the mouse to navigate in VR. Millions of dollars and pounds have been spent on trying to replicate ambulation. After all, that's all we have ever experienced from toddler to where you are now, and our intuition says that's what we need to feel as though we are walking in VR. But it turns out our intuition is wrong. Next slide, please. And that's not the only aspect of how we work where our intuition is wrong. The mind mask shows how our brains are wired to only see positive faces, even though we know the mask is hollow. And VR developers initially thought heads should bob when running in VR. But unlike chickens and pigeons, our species have solved the problem by moving our eyes, the cadence. 
to keep the world still when we walk or run. Walking remains a problem, and not only walking, running around with a blindfold on is a real world problem too. Next slide, please. Robert Sapolsky at Stanford describes in his book Why Rep Zebras Don't Get Ulcers that it's because under attack from a lion, zebras, like us, benefit from the full force of adrenaline. However, after being chased by a lion, assuming it's not been eaten, it doesn't mull over the chase wondering what if and what will happen next time. It just goes back to eating grass. We are different from most species, as we not, are not only primed for survival, which almost always takes precedence, but we recognize and respond to prompts based on memories. Okay, so safety from the real world is also an issue. We will act for survival in VR in the same way we would act in the real world, and if threatened sufficiently, we will run. Okay, next slide, please, Michael. So here's the problem. VR needs physicality to feel real, but the real world is really hard when you collide with it. Clearing a space big enough to be safe works, but is a pain and costly to business, and the world is bigger than a room. These images show a few commercial, largely failed attempts at solving movement in VR, and millions have been spent to solve this problem without a part apparently asking a basic question. Do we remember how we move our legs when we walk? And the answer is no. We don't remember. So the next question is, what brain cues are required for us not to remember how movement happens? The so next slide, please, Michael. So way back in 2006, the founder of Wizdish, Julian Williams, filmed his son, Johnny, using an early version of our rover treadmill. It turns out that for us to forget how we move in VR, three things are necessary. Our feet need to reciprocate. We need to be weight-bearing, and the world needs to move as we expect. Julian obtained a US patent in 2008 on this concept, and I joined forces with him in 2010 to develop a product called the Rover VR Treadmill. Rovers have been sold to big brands and organizations in 33 countries, and tens of thousands of people from four years to 85 plus years have used rovers. The next slide, please. So is VR here to stay? Yes, it is. I put up a few, just a few examples where empathy or visualization of complex systems or pain distraction or training are key benefits of VR. And there are hundreds more. I've also put up Fortnite Arena because though not presently VR enabled, there is precedence for VR orchestral concerts back from 2007. And my bet is the 10.7 million people who turned up virtually one evening to watch a Fortnite Arena conference in February this year will drive Epic, the owners of Fortnite, to this next social evolution of real presence at VR concerts. It seems VR's potential is limited only by our imagination. Next slide, please, Michael. It appears our social, it appears social VR will be a driving force for market growth. And though VR games are fun, it is real places that people want to visit and technology for capturing real places to VR models has accelerated at an amazing pace. Presently, making 3D models of places like Machu Picchu from photographs is roughly equally distant from the challenge of generation of a model from an artist's drawing. Usually, both techniques, photogrammetry and modeling, are used to produce an end result. But this is changing in favor of photogrammetry. N next slide, please. Photogrammetry consists of taking multiple photographs of a place to overcome occlusion. However, images are flat, and we need depth to create 3D models. Passive depth is found using triangulation, a similar pressure to how human eyes tell how far something away is. An active depth measurement uses LIDAR, the time of flight of light pulses to measure distance. 
So take several photographs of the dragon, generate a depth mesh, distort the photographs onto the mesh, simples. You have a 3D model. Most mobile phones can do this now for small objects, and the next iPad Pro will have LiDAR sensors so you can map your home directly into a 3D model. To give some idea of the capability of photogrammetry, next slide, please. This video of Bom Jesus de Monte, a UNESCO site in northern Portugal, shows what can be done with a day of flying a drone, carrying a LiDAR camera, and a few days of post-processing work. And the estimated cost for doing this, a few thousand pounds. I apologize for the jumpy video. I captured this from my screen and was zooming in and out using a mouse. So just gives you some idea. Now, this is a pretty good model. And next week, my colleague and I will explore this model together actually walk around it in VR and test some self-intuition myths, like what do we remember from walk when exploring and checking with a friend? Next slide, please. And what do I mean by social walk? Well, this video shows my CTO, Tom, in Buckingham and me in Oxford, roughly 50 miles apart, using home internet and a Pico Neo 2 headset to drugs to which we use screen capture the world's first walk over 100 meters in VR with no chaperones. This is the first time it was ever done, I believe. We made ethereal blue avatars for this demo. And despite being an old hack in this field, I am amazed at the sense of presence and connectedness that occurs through embodied social VR exploring combined with binaural sound. So as one walks away, so the sound diminishes, as somebody walks past you, so you can sense their presence as they approach you and then as they walk past, just through the sound. Next slide, please. This new direction for our company was initiated last year, and with COVID isolation, it is more needed than ever. Um, and we will offer VR walks of real places for everyone, but initially aimed at those in care homes and their families, and they bring embodied connection and shared experiences, improving physical and mental strength and well-being. And so is VR and AR growing and here to stay? Well, the answer is definitely yes. Both are intimately blended with our lives, and technology is leaping forward, making them less intrusive and easier to access. Market sizes and predicted sales have been hyperbolic, but this is changing and reality is catching up with prediction. We believe VR is waiting for a mouse for safe intuitive navigation to really leap forward. And with lots of hard work and some luck, that will be our Rover VR treadmill. The next slide, please. So to recap, augmented reality is here to stay. It is already ubiquitous in our lives and will grow further. Mixed reality is coming and is absolutely amazing, but this is not an easy technology and the industry and military applications will flourish before consumers gain access. And virtual reality can now replicate our expectations and create feelings of real presence and connectedness. The ability to provide unlimited intuitive movement and social embodied interaction in VR will be a major driver for growth. I believe VR will become a mainstream medium alongside radio, TV, phones, and video calls, opening up new business opportunities and ways to interact in what will be a very different post-COVID world. My, income, my company intends to be a key part of this growth in VR. Thank you. Thank you for your attention and for listening. I'm open to any questions. Um, so please, please. Uh, oh, great, thank Charles. You. Thank you very much. We, we've got some questions, and folks, we, we, because Charles has been so prompt, we'll have uh, time for more. So please do f feel free to submit them. Uh, just to get things started, because there are quite a few um, here, Charles. Uh, Zoe Buckingham is curious. She thanks you for an interesting talk. But do you know what financial institutions are using mixed reality headsets for, or are they just experimenting? 
so the, I, the, the, the concept, um, I understand is, is that, you know, the, the guys in, in on, on, uh, your trading, for instance, um, will have multiple screens. Um, there is, there is a, the, the, the advantage is, is being able to present all of that data and more into the, directly into the field of view. And somehow our brain seems to rewire to be able to cope with that. So, so, so it's, it's for that application, I think, which is where it's, uh, it, it, it's being looked. Yeah, probably a personal comment that uh, Zien, 25 years ago, believe it or not, we were on the front page of the FT, uh, creating a VR system. Uh, we were leading a project with the Ministry of Defense, Silicon Graphics, Virtual Company of Information Technologists, Visa, W at Barclays, uh, Royal Sun Alliance, the Stock Exchange. It was a big project. Yeah. Um, and the VR community kind of sold us that this would be there. But what we did find in practice was that it didn't really apply to finance. Um, you had sort of two axes. You had a kind of, um, what, what would I say, a kind of a, a realistic and symbolic axis and an abstract, um, you know, versus an analogous one. And spreadsheets and all that are the reality, so to speak. The numbers are the numbers. And we never really got any of the models going. And this is despite, you know, advanced MOD doing heads up displays and, uh, helicopter simulators. The flip side to it was that, you know, BT nevertheless launched a system. Uh, you sat in a little pod chair and you turned and you, and on that was a screen projecting. Uh, and that was up at Martlesham about 20 years ago. And again, you know, the traders would go up and play with it for 10 minutes and go, well, that's kind of cool, but nobody ever seems to, to get these in finance. So I'm, I, I'm a little skeptical, but you know, let, let's keep, let's yeah. keep experimenting. Yeah. Anyway, um, got a few fun. Uh, Edwina Morton says, all well and good, perhaps fun and helpful in many contexts, but what are the misapplications of this technology? Are the things that we should be worrying about now? Are there ethical issues that the industry needs to confront? There are. Um, there's no, I have no hesitation in saying there are. Um, one, it, it is possible. So all, all of those neurotransmitters, which are, which are, we're familiar with in our brain, are triggered by being in VR. And so it is quite possible to both live and die in a VR environment. Uh, one can shock uh, and do all sorts of things which, which would be really very unpleasant for people. Uh, and much in the same way as VR is used for solving phobias, um, putting uh, veterans, for instance, back into situations which are warlike, uh, you know, the battles which they have fought, would be a dreadful thing to do for some. Um, Though it may solve PTSD for others, and and it, it, applications of that are are happening. Um, uh, it, 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 so so uh, yes, there are, um, and uh, you know, so uh, um, there are uh, un unpleasant things that one can do in VR, which feel extraordinarily real, um, because VR does that. Uh, so yes, there are real ethical questions. Okay. Um, Trevor Hilder's actually been playing with this for a while. He points out that he was doing some stuff with Second Life back in uh, 2007. He was working with Doug McDavid. I don't know if you know him. His last two years of work for IBM before retirement were entirely in Second Life. And what they were doing was they taught some courses in Second Life with a building that they walked around from room to room, which is quite interesting. And that reminds me, uh, certainly one of the financial applications I've seen, although it seems a bit kind of not quite what you meant, uh, is people providing facilities in these virtual realities, financial institutions that simulate making a payment or going into a bank branch as you would in real life. So that's a that's an interesting bit. Um, you know, because uh, as Trevor points out, uh, Second Life also had a complete economy with its own currency, which is there. Yes, very much so. I mean, Second Life did, did tremendous things. And, and I think it was in Second Life that that very first orchestral I mean, there were other ones that happened that year, but the one which, which I, I think, um, hit, hit the headlines, uh, at least in, in this world, was the, uh, Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, which did, uh, VR, uh, in Second Life in, uh, in, uh, in 2007. So, so, I, I, I think it's social VR and the ability to walk around and, uh, there, there's some evidence that stand up, you know, the, the kind of water cooler style talk. And chats with, with colleagues is really important in financial institutions. That's where information gets transferred, uh, really read readily. And being able to walk around and do that may be a, may be a way of, of, of getting embodied presence with people. 
Um, Although Trevor points out, Second Life folks is still there and profitable, having started in 2003. Uh, but yeah. talking about this water cooler, uh, Michael Grant has a, a point here about multiple people meeting in VR. What, what, what do you do about the visor? It's just not enough to substitute a photo of the person. You need to see the person's eyes and facial expressions in order to be natural and convincing. Do any of the VR headsets uh, use in-visor cameras to be able to transmit some of the facial expressions to the other people? They do. So the, 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 the camera that we use, and it's for business, uh, reasons that we're, we're using it, and it, and it's, and it's a really good, uh, sorry, really good headset, is, is a Pico Neo 2 headset. And there is a version of that called the Pico Neo 2i, which has eye tracking. Somewhat similar, but by the way, you know, the mixed reality HoloLens also has eye tracking. So this is, this is really important. We, we must not underestimate the value of eyes when you're talking to someone. Every now and then you will glance at their eyes because you can tell so much more about their receptiveness. There are information which is presented in the eyes and the muscles around it, which are intrinsic to our understanding and connectedness. And so what, what has been reported is that the Neo 2 i which does eye tracking, can be used to present onto an avatar. So in the social walk you saw with us, we put collision meshes on us so that we kept reasonable distance apart. You can put collision meshes on people so that you can only get 10 people into a room if the room will only in real life take 10 people. Um, and, and then the, the, the eyes of the avatars, which could look like you. So this was Facebook's, this was Facebook's long-term goal was to have real time, full, uh, photographic avatar generation. Uh, mm-hmm. and that the eyes and, and mouths already do that. So, so uh, you, there, there are, Programs uh, in, in the engines in the uh, uh, in these three D engines, which will already map your mouth to the words you're speaking. So so that's already been done, and then it, the eyes will follow you. Now the, the, there's this uncanny valley, which you may be familiar with, which is yeah. getting something a little too close, um, and that's why we put ethereal avatars there because we're aiming this for that group of people who are disconnected, who have lack of choice and opportunity, which are the older generation in, in many instances, and and providing you know, they can choose their avatar, whatever that might be. But it's certainly coming. So but dealing with that uncanny valley is something which we're still, um, you, you need to stay away from it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Charles, actually, for the benefit of viewers, and the, I do have a question on that, then I'd like to move on to the care homes in a second, some other questions here. But uh, it would help if you explain the uncanny valley to those who aren't familiar with that term. And secondly, um, Graham Elliott is curious, doesn't internet latency, latency cause significant issues for VR in the context of Fortnite arena music theater participation? And I, and I would add, you know, in, in the idea of these, uh, virtual meeting rooms, um, you know, is there some kind of internet latent, latency, um, mismatch that, that makes right. that uncanny? So over to you. Right. So, so, first of all, on the Uncanny Valley, there, there is a, we are quite happy, um, and I, I've had many people in VR as cartoons, you know, cartoon environment, they believe it is real, um, and, but they, everything is cartoonish, uh, and that's fine, and we'll accept that. And then as you move towards, and you, you may well have seen some of this on, on the television, robots, which are, are humanoid robots, and they try and make them look more and more and more like a person. And there comes a point in that, where you no longer, where you actually become, start to become worried about what you're looking at. Because it doesn't quite, it's not quite a person, but it's got a lot of the characteristics of it. And, and there is a distinct line beyond which you go and it says, ah, that is now disturbing. Whereas before I knew it was a robot. Now I'm disturbed by it. And that is known as the uncanny valley because nobody's reached the other side at present. <laughs> So nobody's reached the other point where you can say that is human. Yes. So we, we think that that's kind of over here on one mountaintop. I've got cartoons and I'm very happy with those and yeah. they're fun and they're friendly and they're furry and they're colorful. And then I go down this valley where, uh, you know, it's getting better and better. And then I suddenly get to the point where I move up towards realism and I go, ooh, kind of freaky, huh? Yeah, that, absolutely. So, so that's the, the, the challenge there. Um, and the second part was, was associated with, with care, with care homes and, 
Oh, no, 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 it was about latency. Uh, sorry, about latency. Sorry, but no, that's right, about latency. So, so, um, so yes, it's important if you're going to shoot someone. <laughs> so, so, if you've got a whole bunch, if you've got a whole bunch of people in Call of Duty, uh, and they're all trying to shoot each other, then the odd, uh, you know, 0.1, 0.2 of a second makes a real difference. But actually, when you're walking and chatting to people, it doesn't. And, and we're using VoIP. Um, so, so this technology will use VoIP. So, uh, the, uh, what we have found certainly so far, um, is that the, the latency has not been an issue. So, uh, you know, if you're walking with a friend, then, uh, it, it, that, that there isn't, hasn't been a, uh, a latency issue for speaking or movement. We're talking about latencies even on our home internet here or down in the region of, uh, let, well, let, well under 100 milliseconds, yeah. typically down in the region of 30 milliseconds. And those types of, that, you know, some of that can start to be important if you're going to shoot someone, but for the most part, they're not going to be doing that. You know, this, this is, these are social engagement, things where people can go and visit tourist destinations, walk along the wall of the great, you know, rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, maybe visit the Taj Mahal. I was speaking to a group yesterday who are being commissioned to map photogrammetry, Machu Picchu. There are only 500 people a year, sorry, a day allowed on the Inca Trail because it was being destroyed. So not everybody can do it. And this would be a great way of being able to walk. Yeah, I don't know. The convention's about something like 50 milliseconds for sound and 15 milliseconds for most video, but not shoot them up. Yeah, okay. And we're definitely close in many in many areas. Um, now, uh, you've honed in uh, with your WizDish on a system integrated, really, to handle you know therapy and care homes. Uh, Kendall Barrett it, it has got some interesting points here. He's working with a company called uh, I love I love the name VR Aputic uh, V R A P E U T I C. Uh, he's working with a company that's developing therapy models. Uh, they created this tech stack in the VR content, and this was for children on the autism spectrum. Right. But he says it's been very hard to attract investor attention with this model, uh, which promises to make VR therapy accessible to all for, you know, at a low uh, price uh, price point. A- any ideas on how to attract investor attention, or are you in the same boat? So we are we are presently uh, looking for investor attention, but but the um one of, one of the, the challenges with VR is that the people buy, buy VR headsets and then because they can't move around freely, uh, and the challenge of doing that and colliding with the real world is actually painful. So, um, for a whole variety of reasons, it's painful. Uh, uh, but, but the, um, w- what we find is that, that those headsets are sitting on shelves and the VR OEM headset suppliers are, are unwilling to, and un, not unreasonably really, to say that, well, in order for you to use a VR headset, you need a mouse. And you wouldn't, you know, if I, if I remove the mouse from, if you're using mouse, or as opposed to a trackpad to move around the screen in front of you, then you would be, you, you would be stuck really. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a real challenge to, to move around the screen if you haven't got a mouse. Um, and much in the same way, that is true in VR. Now, in order to get investor attention, uh, what we're looking at is a VR as a solution model. So this is a subscription model. So you buy a complete s- solution. You buy um, a, a headset, uh, a, a, a treadmill, uh, and social VR content, which uh, they all go together. They all work together. The, the only company which has actually made real money out of VR so far is Sony. And it's not unreasonable to why that is. It's because... Sony provides a complete solution. The PS4, now PS5 console, um, uh, but certainly the PS4 console with a headset, with content, with all work together. Now it's seated. So you have to get over the problem of feeling ill, and many gamers will, will do that. Um, we've got one or two gamers who have bought our kit and have moved from being seated to running around in PS4 games because they can. Um, and it, but, but that's, so the model is to try and provide something which is a, a no-brainer, really. Um, this, this is, you know, in our model, we, we feel that's the case because we're offering for, similar to a mobile phone subscription, 
uh, over 24 months, you get all of those sessions, plus all the social VR content, uh, and it gives you embodied connection with, with friends and family. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. Um, let, let me feed in a couple more comments, and I'd, I'd like to return to the uh, therapy in a minute. Uh, first is Graham uh, Elliott has come back to point out to us that latency is critical for music, though, and even on the line today, I wouldn't exactly want to be uh, listening to you play guitar, and you certainly don't want to listen to me playing guitar, but that's a different story. That's not for latency reasons. Um, and Mark Cook points out that uh, he did some work with a bank at a company called Soul Machines, soulmachines.com, which was fascinating for mobile banking, and it presented back uh, the facial expression to match the user. So um, you know, another example in finance, folks. Um, but Charles, uh, Graham Gordon points out that you mentioned the use in care homes. And given that this is a very hot topic today on TV and radio and, uh, with Christmas coming up, uh, you know, knowing we, we can roll this out, what's the time frame? Um, it'd be nice to do it for this Christmas, but I, I don't think that's quite on your, uh, uh on your agenda. It, it would be lovely to do this for, for Christmas and, 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 uh, you know the technologies are around to do that. There are some things which we need to understand first, and and so I, I pointed out during the during the talk uh, there that there are some intuitive intuitive things that we believe to be true. They feel like they they should be true, and they turn out not to be. Now it it seems to us that we really what we need to do is to do some pilots first, and so we're looking at doing two pilots down in the southwest. Two care homes down in the southwest and two up here in Oxford. Um, initially, we will place two of our rovers in, in each of those. And so locally, within the same care home, two people can walk around together. And of course, the screen will be mirrored so that their comrades and friends can watch what they're doing and empathize with those movements. Uh, and maybe encourage to want to do it themselves. And then we will link those two care homes together so that those two in the local area can actually meet each other, which they can't do physically, but they can in embodied presence in VR. And then once they've, you know, we'll provide them with some local environment for them to walk around, which they're familiar with, and then we will introduce them to their counterparts in Oxford and Oxford um, down in the southwest. And then they can act as guides to their, you know, so the guides in Oxford could show people down in Cornwall um, the, uh, you know, the, the colleges of Oxford. Uh, and we'll, we'll map, you know, something up here which is of interest, um, which they can wander around, which the people in Oxford are familiar with and therefore comfortable with, and they can show other people. So those are the types of things that we're doing. Um, and in terms of time frame, we're looking to do that this coming year. And it, it may be, there is a, just a possibility we could, we could launch this for not this Christmas, but next Christmas. So that, it's that type of time frame. And, and by the way, much as, you know, all these, you know, vaccines and everything else, we will still be there will be unfortunately another wave of COVID, just like it is with uh, um, with flu during the winter months next year. So it isn't fully over yet. Um, we, we have a way to go. Well, we've got time if we're quick for three more questions. So um, uh, one really is um, when I think uh, about this space, uh, and I, I can get quite excited. You know, you've got. Uh, you explained to me in the warm up, you know, physiotherapists handling 10 patients at once and then helping each other. So it's not just physio, but it's also social, all, you know, all really great stuff. But uh, ultimately, a lot of this also comes down to proof. Uh, so yeah, w where do you guys stand on proving that these approaches are, are there? What sort of research supports those conclusions? OK, so so uh, th there's there's an enormous body of it of research which shows that connectedness, um, being with people, chatting, embodied, uh, now this is in the real world of course, um, has, has amazing effects on well-being, mental health. And, and the lack of that is seen during the COVID, uh, you know, this, this COVID crisis. Um, uh, 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 you, you can see what's happening to people in terms of mental health and well-being in care homes and elsewhere through lack of connection. We are social animals, and it is really a problem for us when that is, is uh, when, when that's not uh, when taken away. And that that is not only true for us, but it's also true in in the prisons and in you know, all sorts of other areas where those, those types of social interactions are removed, and now you know potential for mental health issues. So 
So there's a great body of evidence for that. What, what we have is anecdotal evidence of people who have come to our rovers. So we've had a, a person come to our rovers in their 60s, came towards us on walking sticks, um, really laboured walking. I was really concerned the person would actually reach us without falling over, but clearly this was something we were very familiar with. Um, got to us and said, would it be possible to walk on our rover? And at the time we had a, a mountain and lake and CGI animals uh, system uh, going, and we said, yes, you know, if you can slide your feet back and forth, that's all you need to do. And we put him in, into this. And, you know, I carried on talking with somebody else for about 20 minutes, and I turned around and there was a tear trickling down the cheek of this guy. And I said, are you okay? And he said, I have never been able to walk in this environment ever in my life. So we have some evidence that, you know, the anecdotal evidence. We've had people arrive in wheelchairs um, who've got upper body strength, but their lower body is, is, is not able to enable them to walk, but they can support themselves. And we've got a, a, a railing around our, our and and so they they were able to get in and, and walk around in places that they would never ever be able to do. So one of, that's one of the things that democratizes maybe a little bit. That is that no matter what age you are, you can actually move around in VR. So, uh, or your ability. But it, it does sound like a, a fair chunk of work yet needs to be done to substantiate this, or you you do sound a bit like one of those uh, U.S. preachers. He walks again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, no, no, yeah. That, that's right. So, that, so the proof, that's where the pilots are. So those are the two the two pilots. We'll, we'll be doing all that proof. Clinical and uh, clinical, physical, and psychological data we'll be gathering over this year. Oh, we'd love to, we'd love to hear more about that as it develops. Um, so it sounds exciting. Um, ben Koppelman has a question, uh, a speculative future question. How might VR, AR, and MR relate to developments in neurotech and some of the really exciting research and development in brain machine interface? Yeah, no, no, it's um, it's a really it's it's a good one. So we we've, we've just uh, at the beginning of the year actually we sold three of our three of our rovers went to uh, the new MEG facility in UCL. So uh, this is magnetoencephalogy, so, so the ability to measure what's going on in the brain through the magnetic fields, which are generated by currents which flow in the brain. This new technology is now possible to do. It's been around for a long time, but it used to be done using what were known as squids, which are superconducting uh, devices. These are now... So, so the ability to look inside the brain and give somebody a... Uh, a command to walk or you know, a, a, an environment in which they walk and then see how they respond, how their brain responds to that is, is one way it's been done. But, but so too, um, uh, there's evidence that for people with Parkinson's, for instance, if you can maintain their walking for longer, then they will be able to walk for longer. Does that make sense? So the more you can keep them active, the longer they will retain that. Um, yeah. But it's the motivation. And one of the things that VR does in Spain is to distract so that people do not think about what they're doing, they just do it. Yes, because what they're looking at is much more interesting to them. Charles, this is great. Uh, sadly, we come to the end of time, which is, uh, I, I never need a watch here. It's when people start sending me thanks to you, which I will pass on. Um, folks, it's been, it's been absolutely super and inspiring. Um, I need to give uh, three rounds of thanks, if I, if I may. Uh, Charles, I'll, I'll come to you last if I might. The first one is, Again, to please thank our sponsors. Uh, many of them are involved in AR, VR, and MR. I know that. And many of them are suppliers of a lot of base systems into that space. Uh, and I hope that we someday come up with some type of killer app uh, beyond sex. And hopefully it's in things like care homes and training. But it'd be really nice if uh, we, we could have a session sometime. If you can figure out how to have a whiz dish make sense on a trading floor, I would be delighted to, to feature yeah. just that. Um, if I could, I'd just like to move on and thank the audience. You've been super today. Loads and loads of questions. As I say, they will get to Charles with your emails. Uh, tonight, those of you who don't know, we've got a, 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 an old Bailey movie. We're going to be watching Life is Wonderful, a documentary about the Ravonia trial and Mandela's unsung heroes. There's still time to join if you want to do it. Uh, just go straight to the website and register. Uh, and uh, please do go and pop some popcorn uh, in advance. Uh, tomorrow we'll be looking uh, at a fascinating session about ecosystems for fintech uh, with some heavy input from Belfast. Uh, on Monday, we're going to be looking at e-signatures in Central and Eastern Europe. It's going to be absolutely crucial post-Brexit to understand this. 
and as ever, many other things you can catch on the website. So please do go there. Uh, but finally, Charles, uh, it remains for me to thank you. It is a virtual thank you. Uh, sadly, in this world where I'm unable to open the floodgates of applause, uh, but could I say uh, very, very much uh, thank you on my uh, Buddhist karmic clapper uh, from my uh, Buddhist temple in Bulgoksa. Um, it's super, and uh, we'd love to have you back, and hopefully uh, well before Christmas next year. Uh, and I must say personally, I'd be very, very interested in the scientific uh, support uh, for your program there, because what you've got is a lovely integrating tool for so many of these VR MR and AR applications. So thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. And and to and to the audience. Thank you.